Good evening. My name is Chase Rend, and I have the honor to serve as the executive director here at the National Building Museum. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to, uh, to this museum for this very special occasion, the presentation of the 12th annual Vincent Scully Prize to Adele Chatfield Taylor, president of the American Academy in Rome. The museum is delighted to note that two former Scully Prize laureates have joined tonight's ceremony. Dick Moe, who has retired as president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, received the Scully Prize in 2007 for leadership in moving historic preservation into the mainstream of American life. Through his impassioned advocacy, he expanded the public's understanding of the importance of protecting and celebrating our heritage. And Andres Duani, who together with his partner, Elizabeth Plater Zyberk, received the Scully Prize in 2001 for their leadership in the practice and direction of urban planning. Liz and Andres have truly sparked an ongoing national dialogue about how we should best plan our communities. I would like to recognize now the jury members that made the selection to honor Adele Chatfield Taylor. Jury Chair, David Schwartz, a renowned architect. Ned Kramer, Editor-in-Chief of Architect Magazine. Gary Haney, design partner of Skidmore, Owings and & Merrill, and also a museum board member. Deborah Burke, an architect and also a museum board member. And Liz plater Zyberk, urban planner. I commend the jury for the inspired choice of tonight's honoree. Tonight's headline event will be Adele's presentation on historic preservation and the American Academy in Rome in the 21st century. And I should note that Adele has graciously agreed to take questions from the audience following her remarks. The namesake of tonight's, of tonight's prize is Vincent Scully. Unfortunately, Vince is unable to join us in person, but he did write to me to tell me how delighted he is that we are honoring Adele this evening and he asked me to read this to you, and I quote, I applaud this award of the Building Museum's prize to Adele Chatfield Taylor. It recognizes not only her lifelong work in historic preservation, but also, and most of all, her distinguished stewardship of the American Academy in Rome. The Academy has occupied a central position in the development of American architecture for more than a century. It has encouraged and inspired the work of outstanding architects from McKim, Mead and White to Louis Icahn and beyond. Even more important, it has consistently compelled generations of architects to focus upon architecture's most important as aspect, which is as the builder of cities with the grandest model of all, the city of Rome, right there at hand. I was thrilled to receive Vince's note and his ringing endorsement of the jury's selection of Adele for this honor. I also received a very gracious note from another previous Scully Prize winner, the Aga Khan, who expressed similar sentiments. The Vincent Scully Prize was established in 1999 under the leadership of David Schwartz, the able chair of the Scully Prize jury. The prize recognizes exemplary practice, scholarship, or criticism in architecture, landscape architecture, historic preservation, or urban design. It is with David's vision and the vision of the entire Scully jury that the Scully Prize has become one of the most significant awards in the architecture and design fields. And now please join me in welcoming David to the stage. Well, I do it. I'm not as tall as you are. Well, I do have a piece of paper. Um, I don't really have prepared remarks. Um, trying to think of what to say about Adele is probably one of the most difficult things to do. Um, one of the things I generally do with this is to explain a little bit about the prize. Um, the reason for the Vincent Scully Prize is that we believe that conversations about our built environment are one of the most important sorts of conversations to have and that bringing to the fore people who foster those conversations is something this museum ought to participate in. People deserve recognition for causing us to think about, talk about, consider, and create better built environments. We are all the inheritors of what has come before us, 
and we are all very much live and a product of the generations that preceded us. How we deal with those things, how we react to them, what we build and leave behind for others is something that ought to be a lively conversation amongst us. Too few people act as stewards of our built environment. Too few people take the time to consider how we build, how we live, and how we should build and live. Probably one of the reasons that giving this award to um, Adele is so rewarding for me is not only does she consider these facts carefully, considerately, and continuously, but she does so with a kindness and grace that is rare and distinct among humankind. She is one of the kindest and most considerate people I know, and yet one of the most forceful in being an advocate for the built environment. Um, Vince Scully was one of my teachers in school, and Vince as well caused people to have to consider the built environment. He caused people to think about how they live and think about what footprint they leave behind. The act of building is inherently a very, very iconoclastic and egotistical act. And we need those, as an architect, I can promise you this is true. Um, and we need people like Adele and Vince to make us responsible and considered in what we do and what we leave behind. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the reasons that Adele is so deserving of this award. I'm going to leave that to our next couple of speakers. But I do think that it is really important that this world is served like, by people like Adele and people who care deeply about the history and future of how we live. And with that, I'll introduce Mr. Peck. Thank you, David. Um, and as a former member of, this, uh, of the jury for the prize, I want to congratulate the current jury for its selection. You know, you can read Adele's official resume online, but for omitting the fact that she appeared in two major films, both with screenplays by her husband, it's complete so far as it goes. It just goes only so far. I first met Adele Chatfield Taylor somewhere around 35 years ago at a conference on historic preservation or saving the cities or some such thing. It doesn't matter. The point is that like most men meeting Adele for the first time, I fell in love instantly. She was, as she still is, dazzling, stylish, witty, regal, also insightful, intellectually curious, committed to good causes, and endowed with strategic genius. I did not yet know what you can only learn over the years, that she is also a thoughtful, solicitous, and loyal friend. That day I fell sway to her charms. Adele was already deputy director of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. She was pretty much present at the creation of the modern historic preservation movement. She was one of the first to get a master's degree in it at Columbia University, and shortly after became an adjunct professor of it at Columbia. But Adele's interests range wide. She was never simply a preservationist. She has always been an urbanist. For her, preservation and architectural history are not purely academic interests, but disciplines that have lessons to teach us about building livable cities today. She has been as much a catalyst in the movement to relearn and reapply the historic principles of urban design as she has been a progenitor of the preservation ethic. In the revival of the American city, you can't overstate the importance of her signature accomplishment during her 1980s four-year tenure as director of the Design Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts. Adele co-founded the Mayor's Institute on City Design. The Mayor's Institute, still going strong, is the nation's single most effective means of propelling ideas across the gap between the vision of designers who know what works in cities and the plans of elected officials who need to make cities work. The Mayor's Institute is one of those strategies that flow naturally from Adele's mind. I witnessed another, though you might think of it as tactical brilliance instead. A small class of us, including Adele, began service together some 20 years ago on the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts, the Federal Design Review, Review Board for the nation's capital. In open session, upstairs in this building, right about there, Adele had the most captivating way 
of bringing an applicant to the revelation that his or her design was not heading for approval. In our closed deliberations, I can now reveal, she was stealing our class against what her Preservation Commission experience had taught her, that review board supplicants will absorb a critique, bring back minimal design changes, and repeat the process until the commission, worn down and feeling, um, and feeling bad for causing so much extra design effort, succumbs. On the other hand, Adele also maintained a sense that the aesthetic perfect could be the enemy of the darn good, that the great cities have both spectacular foreground works and higher than average works forming a complementary background. When the American Academy in Rome turned 100 years old in 1994, one would have expected celebrations in New York, its American headquarters, and of course in Rome. But there was also an elegant dinner at, in Washington at the National Gallery of Art in an art-filled corridor at the National Gallery of Art, actually, and if my memory serves me, some recognition also at the White House. Adele was not going to let pass without effect the fact that the Academy was the rare nonprofit that was originally chartered by Congress. Adele's bio, as posted by the American Academy, says this about this woman of the world. Ms. Adele Chatfield Taylor, a Virginian, has lived in New York or Washington since 1967. A Virginian, this citizen of New York, Rome, and the world? Yes, those are her roots, which I think Bill Hart can shed more light on than I can. It did bring to mind the Virginia of Washington and Jefferson, a commonwealth of revolutionary thought cloaked in graceful manners, of statesmen soberly contemplating appropriate architecture for civil society, and proper urban forms for representative government, forms often borrowed from history and, in many cases, from Rome. That's a state worthy of and reflective of the intersecting worlds of Adele Chatfield Taylor, and for that matter, the intersecting worlds of Vincent Scully reflected in this prize. Great, and now if you would please welcome Bill Hart. Good evening, I'm Bill Hart. I'm the chairman of the American Academy in Rome. Those of you who have passed down Second Street in Waterford, Virginia, may have noticed the portrait bust in a window of the cottage Adele Chatfield Taylor shares with her husband, John Guare. It is a copy of the Thomas Jefferson sculpted by Jean-Antoine Houdon. Art tells us more than essays can. Jefferson was a Virginian, an architect, and a genius of design. And these cover Adele's principal points of worship, leaving aside John for the moment. That Jefferson was also president is incidental, perhaps the inevitable outcome of higher callings. He, you'll remember as well, left national office out of his proposed epitaph. Adele was raised in Virginia, and most articles identify her as a Virginian up front if they mean to get her character down and make sense of her love of gardens and architecture. A draftsman right out of college, she worked for the Historic American Building Survey and entered, in its early days, Jane Marston Fitch's storied graduate program in historic preservation at Columbia. Credential enough for the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, where she practiced her charming but formidable advocacy, undermining as necessary Yankee indifference to what they had already built that was pretty good. And then to the US Supreme Court and the Penn Central case. Adele in attendance on April 17, 1978. Grand Central Station was saved and historic landmark designation upheld for the nation. 
NEA's Design Arts Program provided a national forum for Adele's belief that good design can solve any problem. If that seems nearly a tautology, it is also a great truth in her hands. She was tracking Jefferson in a modern age. She had a nose for talent, an instinct for planning, liked taking aesthetic chances and was making a name for herself around the country. In time, she would become trustee of a dozen or so architectural and cultural organizations, such as the National Trust for Historic Preservation and this National Building Museum, advisor to several of our great schools of architecture, and appropriately, trustee of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello. So does this finish the story of the Jefferson bust? Not quite. Houdon, the sculptor, as it happens, was a winner of the Prix de Rome in 1761, which sent him to the French Academy. The same honor and academy, which were inspiration a century and a half later for the Rome Prize and the American Academy in Rome. It was upon that French academy, then in Villa Medici, that J.P. Morgan gazed from the other side of Rome, remarking with satisfaction that the site he had helped assemble on the geniculum for a new American academy building was somewhat higher in elevation. Charles Fallon McKim can hardly have imagined when he dreamed up the idea of an American Academy in Rome, how much, a century later, it would depend for its continued excellence upon this woman from Virginia. When she became its president in 1988, it had a remarkable intellectual and artistic record, but it was fragile. It had never been well endowed, J.P. Morgan notwithstanding, Indeed, he died before the new building was completed. And after a tumultuous century, it was threadbare. Its community of artists and scholars, memorably described by an early director as spendthrifts of imagination and misers of fact, was distinguished, but living in straitened circumstance. Adele had been one of them herself, a 1983 Rome Prize Fellow in Historic Preservation. So she knew the situation, and she had some ideas. If you've been to Rome in recent years, you've seen the results. All eight of the Academy buildings, as well as extensive grounds and gardens, have been restored and renovated, beginning with the signature McKim Mead and White Building itself. Restoration is too flat a word for work that has strengthened every important architectural bone, saved the smallest historical detail, revealed and embellished where character could be deepened and function improved. The money for this came not from endowment or borrowings, but from an enlarged circle of friends drafted and cajoled by Adele. And that endowment, modest since the Academy's founding, has been increased to the point where it funds nearly half of an annual budget, exceeding $10 million, with more to come. If you haven't been to Rome and the Academy recently, well, imagine early evening, a Roman sky above the stone pines the dome of Jefferson's beloved pantheon below in the city, a drift of piano music from one of the studios, local fare served in the cortile by Alice Waters' Rome Sustainable Food Project, the musings and inspirations of 30 fellows and their companions, a MacArthur winner here, a Pulitzer there, the trickle of water in Paul Manship's fountain. It's all a matter of design, as Jefferson would appreciate. 
Adele has already been decorated by the President of Italy for this work. How wonderful now to have her honored at home in the name of Vincent Scully, a former Academy resident himself, one of the great explicators of architecture, historic preservation, and urban design, the stars to which Adele hitched her wagon years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Chase, David, all you wonderful jurors, old friends so eloquent and touching, Bob Peck and Bill Hart. I'm deeply grateful to each of you for your words and for this honor and for this great occasion seeing so many old friends, family, and colleagues. It's wonderful to be in your presence and that of previous laureates tonight. I salute and bow to you all. I'm especially touched that this prize is named for Vincent Scully, who's a hero and leitmotif of my life. And a presence, as Bill said, at the American Academy in Rome, on and off for more than half a century. We've heard that the Vincent Scully Prize was created to recognize and encourage those who've committed their lives to interpreting, improving, and making understandable the built world in which we live. So since I have never been alone in my interests, we talked about these things I have had the good luck to work on for the last 45 years. Every night at the dinner table when I was growing up and with friends and colleagues forever after that. So I have to implicate you all in this story and in this honor as well. Especially my mother, Mary Owen Lyon Chatfield Taylor in the front row and my husband, John Guare, who has put up with my obsessions for over 35 years, and in some cases become obsessed himself, which I consider the height of loyalty. It means a lot that this event takes place in and under the auspices of the National Building Museum, a beloved and familiar landmark and institution with the best gift shop on the East Coast, where I intend to do some Christmas shopping as soon as I get down from here, but I see they've just turned off the lights. But I hope you realize this about it, and if you can't shop there tonight, you'll come back tomorrow. I've been asked to say a few words on historic preservation and the American Academy in Rome that I haven't said before and I welcome the opportunity to reflect anew on my two favorite subjects. But since there isn't much that I've never said before, <laughs> I'm gonna have to talk a little bit about myself, which is quite difficult. But I'll begin. In 1951, when he was 19, John Updike wrote the following in a letter to his parents. Quote, we do not need men like Proust and Joyce. Joyce, men like this are a luxury that an abundant culture can produce only after the more basic literary need 
has been filled. This age needs men rather like Shakespeare or Milton or Pope, who are filled with the strength of their cultures and do not transcend the limits of their age, but working within the times, bring what is peculiar to the moment to glory. We need great artists who are willing to accept these restrictions and who love their environments. Whatever the many failings of my work, let it stand as a manifesto of my love for the time in which I was born." Unquote. I read these words only a few months ago after Updike died, and they rang the bell that led me to cut out the article and put it into my file marked Clues. As a reader of 20th century writing, poetry especially, I collect anything that seems to parallel or shed light on why so many of us are interested in historic preservation. Updike's plea that we focus on the minutiae of our own time, giving the mundane its beautiful due, as he did in his prolific work, is what I would like to make some observations about for a few minutes today. To begin with a little background, I came into the world at the tail end of World War II, early on a January day in 1945, when my very young mother and father were living in Washington, a stone's throw from my father's parents, who provided a lush senior presence, a hub that could be depended upon for long Sunday lunches, news, and succor of all sorts. I mention this because unbeknownst to anyone, I believe it was the last time in their lives they were a protected part of the old-fashioned fabric of far large families nearby, houses passed from generation to generation, and continuous values. Even if they had tried, they would not have been able to overcome the tide of post-war life, the new world, and progress. The idea of progress dominated the country and even our traditional life. We tried margarine, tang, and television because they were said to be better than anything else and because they were new and exciting. But at the same time, we clung to our old ways and were not allowed Coca-Cola store-bought presents, or bad manners. I trace my interest in historic preservation to three memories, two from my early childhood and one from an early job. The first was an event that occurred on a summer day when I was three or four years old on Nantucket Island, where I was with my family, all spread out on blankets on the beach and every person but me in a cocoon of reading. It happened to be at that moment that I realized that reading was the key to everything, especially independence. And I was confused because I did not know how to do it. To distract me, my grandmother, an architect, Man Kay, explained that I would soon learn to read a book, but in the meantime, she would teach me how to read a building. And there, on the damp sand of the Nantucket beach, she drew me my first floor plan. Something in me clicked. Architecture became my language for life, and I thought I would die of joy. Aside from summer visits to Nantucket, I grew up in Virginia in a 19th century brick house built by Quakers. 50 miles outside Washington in Loudoun County. We loved Virginia with its history, farms, box bushes, horses, and dogs. In those days, Loudoun County was considered way out in the country, and any father such as mine, who worked in town, as Washington was called, joined a carpool to get to the office. The carpool car was a two-door sedan 
with room for five souls. Every morning, they met early at Clark's Gap, packed themselves in, and took off on the 50-minute drive, all of them smoking their heads off. They followed Route 7, which was a two-lane road. One, led, one lane led east to the outside world and the city. The other led west to the Blue Ridge Mountains and the light. My mother often drove, drove my brothers and sisters and me to Washington along the same route to visit the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian, or our grandparents. So we automatically memorized the countryside as we looked out the window on the way. In about 1952, the first farm in this countryside was sold to developers. And so for the next couple of years, we drove back and forth and watched as the pastures and cornfields turned into Sterling Park with houses, asphalt, concrete curbs, and garages. A couple of innocent old barns that had seemed stitched into the landscape and that we had thus come to own as part of our field of vision disappeared one day taken down because they were in the way of this orderly march of identical new stuff that stretched as far as the eye could see. The demolitions of these barns, which were live characters to us, seemed like incredibly careless deaths to me. And I got the idea then in the car to spend my life preventing th such things from happening by becoming a cross between an architect and a doctor who would take care of old buildings that found themselves in a situation like this. So that was the second thing. Our mother loved old houses and we drove all over Virginia looking at them. There was some historic preservation going on in those days having been brought to bear through heroic actions at Mount Vernon, Monticello, and Stratford Hall. But finding a way to save an ordinary old building was very difficult. There was no landmark commission that you could petition for designations, no public funds, few historical societies, and few usable laws. Mostly one had to revert to lying down in front of the bulldozer. Or, if you happened to be related to my maternal grandmother, getting out of the car when she told you to, to tear down any advertising that might have inadvertently been plastered to a Loudoun County telephone pole. We didn't know how to work together to get word ahead of time when a building was in danger, or to think of a new use before a roof started to leak, or get ourselves into the planning process so that we didn't always get to the point of the bulldozer. But I was fortunate to have been born when I was, although bad things were happening, because there was also a widespread awakening to the fact that we were losing our relationship with our landscape, suburbanizing the countryside, surely one of the great paradoxes of all time, in the middle of a brutal century when more lives and property had been lost by 1950 than in all the rest of history combined, and then followed by a building boom during which the United States developed more land than between 1607 and 1945, all put together. We were forgetting our habit of maintenance, the normal practices through which preservation had always taken place previously as a matter of course. When things are mended, extended, reused, and then for finally worn out and retired, because we were blithely replacing them on whatever seemed like a whim. We were also buying the idea of highest and best use through which we were supposed to feel a moral obligation to develop any parcel of real estate to reach the maximum in terms of its legal, physical, financial, and productive potential. This was the obsession with progress. As an aside, I should say that one of the most confusing things about this period was that those who were doing these dreadful things, particularly urban renewal, were idealistic and often very nice people. 
I feel compelled to mention this because anyone younger than our generation generally does not realize how much these men believed they were right and how they were trusted and revered because now they're regarded as devils. It's important to remember that nothing is ever black or white. It's the trademark of any age to believe that its thinkers are right, but it seemed particularly so in the 50s and 60s when this country was somewhat idolized for its role in World War II, and somehow everything that came from the US then was thought to be the last word. The urban renewal policies and the highways and the huge financial grants that were part of urban renewal had tremendous momentum and were welcomed by the mayors and city planning directors in all major American cities. The only city that I believe refused the money and the bulldozer was York, Pennsylvania. We watched urban renewal begin in the cities near us. The bulldozers came in and the clearance took place. But then it was not followed by the hammering and raising of rafters and pouring of concrete that one might idealistically associate with new building and improvement. Just the crunching of the little houses with their sagging front porches and barking dogs and flower beds, run down but alive. After that, there were bare lots and complete silence. And that was that. That was urban renewal or so it seemed. To the pre-rational being, which I still was at that point, or even a rational one, it was utterly memorable because it seemed downright insane. Sure enough, the two lanes of Route 7 became four and then eight. The developments multiplied. I learned to read and went up north to boarding school and college studied art and art history and mechanical drawing and took a part-time job with an architect in Irvington, New York. After graduating, I looked around for an architecture school that featured historic preservation, then finding none, moved back to Washington to work for an architect who, quote, liked old buildings. So my first full-time job was to work for him in a three-person office as a draftsman and a gal Friday. And my first assignment was to assist with the design and renovation of two side-by-side -side Victorian townhouses on Market Street in Leesburg, Virginia. On my first site visit with the boss, he confided that we were going to strip the facades of their brackets, lintels, and sills, smooth them off, and put on a colonial gloss. I asked him why, since they seemed perfectly fine as they were, and he explained that the job of an architect was to make a statement, bring about change, and give the client his money's worth. I realized then that I wanted the architect's tools and expertise, but not to be an architect, at least not one like that. I knew the preservation had something to do with architecture, but only the way painting has something to do with paint. So that was the third thing. A few months later, I hit upon the Historic American Building Survey, the HABS, a government program that had been invented during the WPA, during the Depression, through which important old buildings were measured, drawn, photographed, and written up, and then these records filled, filed in the Library of Congress. I quit my job with Colonial Gloss and started to work for HABS. There I learned of the Columbia University program in historic preservation, got in, and moved to New York for good. The hero of the historic preservation program was James Marston Fitch. In 1967, when I enrolled, he was just getting it going, the first program in the country, and was generally only one step ahead of the sheriff. So when he couldn't figure out what to do next, he would put us in a station wagon into which the whole class fit, and we drove up and down the eastern United States looking at old buildings and meeting the people who were saving them. It was a perfect experience. We met Antoinette Downing from Providence, St. Clair Wright from Annapolis, and Frances Edmonds from Charleston. These women were giants. They did whatever it took, drafted legislation, wrote editorials, befriended politicians, raised money, 
set up organizations, photographed, researched, painted, scrubbed, made sandwiches, cajoled, tried and tried again. And they were succeeding, often single-handedly, in saving the threatened historic places where they lived. Fitch's program was a marvelous education for many reasons, not the least of which was bringing us in contact with these fantastic people and with each other. Because it was such a sparse network of people, it always reminded me of the Underground Railroad where someone had to call ahead to put you in touch with the right person. So after graduate school, some of us got together and started an architecture and historic preservation firm in New York in 1968, in the turmoil and excitement of that moment, and called it Urban Deadline Architects to underline the fact that we felt if we did not intervene to save the old fabric of New York City and Patterson, New Jersey, Leonard, where are you? Because it had been laid out by Pierre Charles L'Enfant, both would be lost forever. The mood was captured in a poem by James Merrill called An Urban Convalescence, in which he observed in part, as usual in New York, everything is torn down before you've had a time to, check, to care for it. It is not even as though the new buildings did very much, much for architecture. Suppose they did. The sickness of our time requires that these as well be blasted in their prime. You would think the simple fact of having lasted threatened our cities like mysterious fires. In time, I joined the staff of the new New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, Frank Gilbert is here, where I remained for 11 years. At a certain point, having the good luck to take a leave of absence to go to the American Academy in Rome with the Rome Prize, which gave me a chance to think about all of this. I had applied to go to do precisely that. I adored my job at the Landmarks Commission, mostly because of the public hearings that went on constantly, which most people found bone-crushingly dull, but which I found fascinating because of the things people said and the reasons they gave about why they wanted to save something. Their testimony seldom had anything to do with architecture or history, but instead with some deep association with the place, often tremendously personal, which rang true. Furthermore, no one ever said the same thing. It was one of the only experiences I've ever had where people had a tendency to actually tell the truth. Because where else can you express this? By that time, the early 80s, we could not help but be pleased with the progress that was being made with preservation nationwide. We'd witnessed the passage of important legislation, especially the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which created the National Register so we could list things of local significance. The establishment of Preservation Action, our national grassroots lobby in 1974, I'm saluting you, Tersh and Nelly. And the Tax Reform Act of 1976, providing tax credits for certain income-producing preservation projects, thereby putting significant old buildings into the mainstream of development, whereby historic preservation became a means to an end, even when it was not a cultural commitment. A lot of preservation work was going on, although much was still being lost. A continuing worry for some of us was that once a building was rescued, those in charge seldom considered anything but a full-blown, multi-million dollar restoration or reconstruction as the way to preserve it. And to this day, it is more or less our favorite model of what to do. There were reasons for this, building codes, a lack of architectural elements available that fit old buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was always also, it seemed to me, a psychological factor, which was that as a culture we were still, still threatened by anything old, old people and old buildings that actually look old. 
We can accept old buildings that look brand new, but as a, as a society, we do not do well with things that are faded, wrinkled, or decrepit. In any case, I tore myself away from all this fascinating and preoccupying world and went to Rome. The American Academy was at that time an 85-year-old center for independent study that gave the Rome Prize Fellowship in all kinds of subjects that had long been of interest, architecture, landscape, painting and sculpture, art history and literature. It also had artists and scholars working on things I had never known up close, music composition, classical studies, and archaeology. The routine at the academy was that one went one's own way in the mornings and afternoons, but gathered for meals and for walks and talks. The upshot of this constant, at first pragmatic, interaction was that we talked continuously and unselfconsciously about what we were working on. And by the time a few months had passed, there had been woven an intricate, multifaceted, broad edifice that defined our group. And we began to go places together and collaborate, explore, and expand. Days were spent sifting through Rome's famous layers, going up blind alleys and behind gigantic doors. It took quite a long time to understand what it meant that Rome was thousands of years old. It is true of some other places on Earth that date back as far or farther, but what is different about Rome is that all its layers from those years are still quite accessible and still very alive. So besides there being the well-known masterpieces, the Pantheon, San Divo, San Piazza Navona, and the Colosseum, Rome is made up of fragments and ruins, building parts that had started out as one thing and then gotten absorbed into something else, some of it beautiful and stately, some almost unintelligible, but all of it still sending out a signal, no matter how faint. Rome engorges whatever is added to it. There seems to be no end to its power to assimilate, wrote Elizabeth Bowen. Knowledge of Rome must be physical, sweated into the system, worked up into the brain through the thinning shoe leather. When it comes to knowing, the senses are more honest than the intelligence. Rome is a continuity called eternal. What is accumulated in this place acts on everything, everyone, day and night, like an extra climate. Because it is a living city, too dense to master, you're compelled to discover and assemble your own version of it, which gives you an intimate insight that never quite leaves you once it takes over. It was thrilling to see that Rome's value was not something that all had agreed upon that could be objectified, quantified, and then hung on a hammer, hanger and saved. That it had to be this jumble, different things to different people. And like any true work of art, a jumble that stood up to all kinds of scrutiny and debate. The poet Gertrude Schnackenberg wrote this about Rome. Inevitably, it occurs to each and every artist who comes to visit Rome that the women sitting by the fountains tending their babies, the men driving the fruit and vegetable trucks in from the countryside, the spectators who spend whole afternoons gazing from the second and third story windows above the piazzas, that these citizens are the self-same goddesses and gods portrayed in kilometers of marble sculpture adorning Rome's museums, basilicas, and palaces, and presiding over her facades and fountains. Portrayed in the medium of marble, they are hundreds or thousands of years old. Portrayed in the medium of flesh and blood, they are our age. Countless worlds are superimposed, stacked up, crumbling in Rome, and still there is only one city. When I lived in Rome in the 1980s, it was becoming interesting again to contemporary artists who were coming to the academy to work. Mary Miss, David Ireland, Martin Purrier, and Saul LeWitt. What was new and different about that 
was that these artists were still creating things out of new media, but specializing in using as their starting point that which already physically existed. Preservationists were accustomed to working with architects, but not contemporary artists until that time. And whereas some preservationist architects, as I've already said, were spending millions stripping the patina off old buildings to make them look brand new once it was restored, these artists went to great pains to protect this aged skin that could only come from long years in history of being battered and bathed in the events and weather and story of the place a sensibility that used the accumulation as the starting point. This was one of the most heartening revelations of my stay in Rome, and these artists and others have added a wonderful t dimension to historic preservation. At the end of the fellowship, I came back to the States and spent the next period at the National Endowment for the Arts, at the design program, where the place was abuzz with these collaborations between preservations and contemporary artists and architects including the mayors, as it is to this day. Returning to the academy in Rome in 1988, it did not take long to discover what had to be done to rebuild the program and the property from the top to the bottom. Of all the blessings that have pulled the institution through the daunting 20th century, none could top the gift of the team we had in place to work on the academy over the last 20-some years. The trustees were remarkable, wise, and generous. The staff intelligent, experienced, and loyal. I'm not sure any of us could have put into words, but there was absolute agreement that our principal objective was that the survival of the soul of the place had to come first, not the perfecting of the architecture. We had a very tight budget, so these priorities hit the spot. We approached our alumni, circulating a questionnaire to every living person who'd ever passed through the academy, and the message that came back reminded me of my beloved public hearings. Occasionally there was a suggestion about a door that was stuck that needed repairing, or an inquiry about a suitcase that had been left behind and some of those writings had not been to Rome for 50 years, but they still felt that the place belonged to them and wanted to make sure we would not touch a hair on its head without knowing how much they cared. Most preservation efforts are directed at saving the grandest and the best, but in the case of the Academy, the goal was to carry the place into the next century with its values intact and its everyday meaningfulness intact. In this country, we're seeing more of these wonderful everyday places. Eleanor Roosevelt's Val Kill at Hyde Park, so modest that when she had extra guests for Thanksgiving dinner, they had to open a card table out into the hall and bring in found folding chairs. It speaks volumes about the way this woman chose to live. It is one of the most memorable places I've ever been because of its simplicity and authenticity, pretty much the way she left it. There is Georgia O'Keeffe's house at Abiquiu, honed in Spartan, perfectly situated for the morning and afternoon light for the life of this erect and mysterious painter. There is Walter Gropius' study at his house in Lincoln, Mass., with its cork floor and reading glasses on his desk. Thomas Jefferson's study and bedroom at Monticello, and Eudora Welty's house in Jackson, Mississippi. The mosaics at Ostia and Rome, laid by hands like yours and mine 2,500 years ago and still matter-of-factly trod upon without being any the worse for wear. The Tenement Museum on the Lower East Side in Manhattan with its worn floors and smells and cramped spaces and dim light, so much more alive than the period rooms at some of the grand museums, which seem to be done over constantly to accommodate new standards of authenticity and interpretation. The Academy has some of these real qualities, a 
place that has been around much longer than any of its present occupants, but that has been used in much the same way since the beginning. And if it has still a magical quality, that is because its well-worn rights of way have survived. Special entries into the library, rituals in the studios, coming together at meals, climbs up the hill, views out the high windows into the mist of Rome. The Academy is not a delicate flower. The property has one great landmark, a Baroque villa that dates from the mid-17th century with lavish gardens and grounds on the highest point within the walls. But otherwise, it is a set of mostly 100-year-old buildings filled with their original tables and chairs, books, easels, door latches, rugs, and lamps from the beginning of the 20th century, whose collective significance derives from the dreams and juxtapositions and habits of those who used them over the years. We fit perfectly into this kind of stream of history. We are an unusual institution. We don't want to get bigger because being small is one of the things that works about the Academy. We don't want to change our mission because when properly pursued, we have the most up-to-date minds and ambitions imaginable. So that in fact, the fact that it goes on being the vessel for the same purpose for which it came into being, particularly because the artists and scholars are so different now from what they were in 1895, confers a value on it, a worth that is very unusual. In 1895, when the United States was coming into its own and building its institutions and its infrastructure, it was sending Americans to Rome, as our founders would say, to develop so that they could develop taste and master the classical education. A lack of classicism is not always the problem for fellows of the American Academy in Rome today. These people travel constantly, see everything, are exceedingly, exceedingly well educated, and they can generally master any style. They are, these are not the problems of our time. The problems of our time are how to do better town and city planning, how to more efficiently reuse empty spaces in cities, how to rethink energy use and energy sources, how to grow edible food, how to reduce waste, achieve sustainability, respect the environment, and simplify the way we live. 100 years ago, we had at the Academy such people as John Russell Pope, Paul Manship, and Norman Newton. Today, we have Keel Moe, Kate Gilmore, and Fritz Haig. We are quite literally on another planet. The preservation stat strategy for the 21st century then is to stay the course, sustain the mission, keep things in good shape, continue to build the library into the world-class resource that it's dependent upon to be, make ourselves sustainable, and make the Rome Prize better known to all those who could benefit from it. And in the words of Wallace Stevens, perhaps echoing John Updike, to savor and share the rapture of things as they are. Thank you very much. We do have a microphone, so if you do have a question um, for Adele, please raise your hand as we are recording tonight. You mentioned a long list of pressing concerns for arts of the moment, and you seem to suggest that classical education and the development of taste had no bearing on these, but it seems to me that those are really important tools to address that long list that you followed it with. So in a sense, they are on the same planet, it would seem to me. I didn't mean to say they had no place. I think they will always have a place, and the Academy will always play a major role in providing 
classicism and Rome. And I think anyone, everyone has to spend time in Rome to really be completely immersed in those things. I realize it was a bit melodramatic to say it that way, but I believe that it's not the only thing, and that was more the point I was trying to make. And I think that the starting point for a classical education can begin somewhere other than Rome. It's not as stark as it was in 1895 in those days. There were four architecture programs in those days, and there was no graduate study for architecture. McKim and the founders felt that the Grand Tour, which was where a classical orientation often came from, should not just be for the rich and privileged, but that it should be a democratic process so that those who most merited the investment could win the Rome Prize and go to Rome. And it was really the sole purpose, as the founders expressed, for the first years that the Rome Prize was given. And in fact, John Russell Pope was the first winner of the Rome Prize. I'm glad you asked, actually, because it gives me a chance to kind of nuance this a little bit. But um, I think Rome will always be dependent upon, and we will always be dependent upon. And frankly, even if you weren't, didn't think you needed it or didn't want it sitting next to a classicist at the American Academy in Rome table, you wind up learning an awful lot, no matter what. I think my point is that it's, no, it's not the most pressing thing in the world that these other things, it has a place at the table, but all of these other things are equally pressing. But I thank you for the question and enabling me to elaborate. Anybody else? Yeah, a lovely speech. Um, Thank you. Several well-turned and poetic phrases that convey the meaning of and the beauty of preservation. Uh, one thing you said was that uh, as a society, we're uncomfortable with that which is old. And I'm just wondering, what is our message as preservationists to the public? How do we make it more meaningful? And um, what is the message that will resonate with this society which is uncomfortable with that which is old? I think we're getting better. Um, I think it would help if we practiced a little historic preservation of things that we didn't spend millions of dollars on. And this is another great lesson that Rome has to impart. I mean, sometimes it's enough just to hold it up with a stick and um, there, these can be tremendously successful, beautiful additions to a city or a farm or any place. I think we uh, are a group of people who are most comfortable with extremes. I think it's something Americans specialize in. And with the pendulum swinging, it's all, either all this or all that. I think it's part of growing up as a country, growing up as a society. I actually think we're getting a little better with things that are older. Um, preservationists, I think, have a lot to do that is in the middle ranges, not just the great and the grand, but those A minus buildings and uh, the hamlets and the towns, things that can contribute a great deal to the world by, by just living out their natural life. I think our compulsion to tear things down because, they're, things are, because it's looking a little ratty is extreme. And um, it would help if there were more incentives, if the, if the incentives didn't exist so exclusively for new building and didn't have such an accelerated view of a building's useful life, which apparently is, uh, has long been about 30 years. I mean, we know this to be ridiculous. 
So what about giving the preservationist a break and making it less onerous to preserve buildings that perhaps aren't the Taj Mahal, but that are very valuable. I think Dick Moe has done a lot of work on this when he was working on sustainab his sustainability initiative at the Trust. Where are you, Dick? Um, simply counting uh, the value of the building for the fact that it does, it's still standing and surely can be used for more things more productively than tearing it down. I just think we have a tremendously long way to go. And this model of the pristine thing that really makes it sort of super duper tippy top and meeting the last letter of the law, which I have nothing against, but um, there's gotta be some middle ground. In Rome, one learns a lot about this because the vast majority of the city is old, so you can't possibly invest millions in every single square inch of it. And you learn to live with things that aren't, I mean, this is part of learning to live with ourselves as we get older. Um, I think we just have to work on it a little harder. I don't know what the answer is. I think the longer you live, the more interesting it gets. So. Um, there's a lot of reasons to look forward to it. And old buildings certainly have a lot to impart the older they are. I also think if they aren't stripped of every single detail of the experience they've had previously right down to the studs, that they can be very comforting spaces to occupy. I don't know if that helps, but... Um, this has got to be a project for all of us, I think. Not tearing it down, just leaving it alone. Thanks for the question. I have one quick question for you, Dale. Can you talk a little bit more about the balance and the synergy between sustainability and historic preservation? You just teased on that, but it seems of late that it's sustainability versus historic preservation when it should be sustainability and historic preservation. Um, Dick Moe talked about this a couple years ago that the greenest building is the one that's already built. Um, but if you can talk a little bit more about that. I, uh, the, be the best imaginable example of sustainability, it seems to me, is preservation. I think the ratings and the points and all of that haven't quite caught up with the reality of what old buildings have to offer it could be a lot more significant, the credit one gets for saving old buildings. But just from a common sense point of view, uh, the lessons that old buildings have to teach, I mean, by bu being built in, uh, with southern exposures so that you get the maximum of warmth to not have windows on the north because that's where the wind comes from, this kind of thing. These are all things that get forgotten when um, houses are being designed by kind of from a roll of wallpaper. I mean, there's a real reason why they, the old buildings were built the way they, they're, they're well worth studying. And the best way to have them uh, stand for those things that they do for us is to still be in the landscape and still for us to live in them. Probably the most important thing for us to do is, is live in old buildings. I mean, the uh, popularity of house museums seems to be on the decline, and it seems to me the cure for that would be to instantly let each house museum be lived in by a person and taken care of by somebody who cares about it, because first of all, it will enliven the space and second of all, it will keep it from being in danger to some degree. I think we could save a lot more buildings if we could make them a special category. Um, sustainability, I think, is a much more nuanced thing than it's thought to be. And um, closing the shutters is a great way to cool off your house. You don't have to have air conditioning in every single square inch. Take it from my mother. and. Um, there are many ways of comfortable living in an old space that doesn't have to be modernized. You're not making sacrifices. 
I think it can be a very, very viable choice, and probably we need to do a better job of making that understandable to people. Thank you. Oh, one last question. Um, yes, you mentioned uh, some artists that you'd uh, had at the Academy. And I'm curious, I don't know that much about what the Academy does and what the daily life of the uh, fellows uh, is like. And uh, you talk specifically about Martin Purrier, whose art I really like, but about whom I know really very little, almost next to nothing. And I'm curious if you have any stories about Martin, this time about Martin or, or other artists who were there. Wonderful what, what person. Yeah. He uh, has been to Rome several times, and he was on the board. The question was, uh, what happens when contemporary artists go to Rome? Is that fair? The answer is, uh, everybody works independently, but we spend a lot of time together because we really live together in this, in this place, and we have lunch and dinner together, and do a lot of looking and studying together. And Martin uh, is a collector of old tools, so I can remember going around Rome with him, and a lot of the things he collects are things that he winds up making works of art that look like they're in the same family somehow. He loves Rome because of its oldness and um, wornness, if you will, which is something that his art often looks like, as though God did it somehow. It's so flawless and inevitable looking. And uh, he, I think, immediately took to it. I, I don't know whether he had spent a lot of time there before, but um, and he went into the countryside. He's very interested in farms and what happens in the countryside and ancient practices from the countryside. And uh, he spent a lot of time doing that, uh, pursuing those interests. I went with him and his family a couple of times doing that. And um, I remember a particularly wonderful trip to Arezzo where he was going to the flea market and while we were at it going to see Fra Angelico, et cetera, Pierre. So um, it was, uh, it was uh, made for Martin to be in Italy and to be in Rome and um, to look at everything through that special lens that he has as an artist with his particular view and the his particular search for those things, that he's always looking for things that are made out of iron or wood or stone, which are the medium that those are the media that he works in. And um, those were memorable, memorable times. He still comes back whenever he can. I hope you saw his show, the, the big retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. It was beautiful. Yeah. I think that is it. It's probably time for dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Adele, for an absolutely captivating presentation. And to close, I just want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. I do hope you enjoyed the uh, program. And please join me one more time in congratulating Adele for her prize. <laughs>